Uh, so, I am speaking for, no, I guess, Mohammadi, and this is the third time I've spoken for her, and I read pretty much the same piece the first two times, and thought about doing something new, and then I kind of thought, well, you know, it's in the nature of what's happening in a way that we should, you know, repetition is very much part of her world, nothing has changed for her, um, the facts of the case haven't, stayed, haven't changed, the nature of the injustice that has been done to her, it's continually been done to her, is still the same, so I thought in a way I should retread the same ground and um, you know there are a few new things to say within that but essentially nothing has changed which is part of the tragedy. So um, in May 2016 the Revolutionary Court of Iran sentenced Nargis to 16 years in jail um, the charges included being a member of an organisation called Step by Step to Do Stop the Death Penalty and committing propaganda against the state. And uh, when you look into that propaganda campaign, you realise that what she was trying to do, so called propaganda campaign I should say, was to stop the state from killing juvenile offenders, which is to say to stop the state killing children. Uh, so she's now in Elvin Prison, which is quite notorious here in the UK because uh, Nazanin Zagiri Radcliffe is there too. Um, Nargis quite often endures solitary confinement. She's been ill, most of the time she's been there, and getting more ill, increasingly worryingly so. Uh, she's got a neurological disorder which causes muscular paralysis. Um, for a long time she's denied access to a neurologist, it's still clear that she isn't getting the care she needs. She's also got a hunger strike, her health continues to deteriorate, and um, you know, she's in a precarious situation, very much under the power of uh, these people, she can't do anything to change her situation except kowtow to them in a way, so um, her reaction of course has been to continue to speak out. Uh, so just this December that's gone, she released a letter about recent killings in Iran uh, following the protests uh, that happened in December, and she says the state has shown that it is not able to tolerate the most peaceful of protests. Even its reaction to a silent march has been to fire bullets, and she wrote this whole brilliant, angry, defiant letter that uh, you can go and look at on the internet. I urge you to do so. It's brilliant. She is not backing down. And there's a lot more to her story that I'd urge you to look into. And of course, when you read the story, you'll feel the injustice, you'll want to help. And of course, that's why we're here tonight. And for Nargis, there is something you can do, or at least feel in a way that it's a contribution. Um, there's a website that friends and supporters have set up, uh, humanrightsontop.wordpress.com, and when you click on that, the first thing you see is a gallery of photos of mountains from around the world. And the website explains, foremost, we hope to raise awareness for Nargis Mohammadi's case so that she is released and free to explore all these mountains and places along with her family. Nargis's hobby used to be mountain climbing. When she was a university student, she was banned from mountaineering due to her political and human rights related activities. Uh, but now people are sending her pictures. And I don't know if she can see them in prison, but there's still something I find really moving about this gesture. The mountains represent an idea of beauty and freedom, an alternative world where Nargis is able to roam where she wants, enjoy nature on her own terms, just feel the wind on her face. And the pictures are touching individual acts of kindness. The people who have gone to the trouble of sending them are really sending a message of solidarity and hope. So I've tried to take inspiration from that in what follows. 
I want to give my own small gift to Narcos, which will be a walk on the mountain I love the most. Well, I say it's a mountain, but actually it's more of a hill. It's called Whitbarrow, and it lies on the edge of the Lake District. Its summit is only 705 feet above sea level, but that summit does glory in the name of Lord Seat. The rest of the hill is a long exposed limestone escarpment laid down in the Carboniferous period 350 million years ago. It's a site of special scientific interest, full of rare habitats, glacial erratics, and unusual rock formations. It's a special, incredible place. Uh, but don't take it from me. Um, in the outlying fells of Lakeland, the great bard of fell walkers, Alfred Wainwright, describes the walk up Whitbarrow as the most beautiful in this book. Beautiful it is every step of the way. All is fair to the eye of Whitbarrow, says Wainwright. And he's right. But I love it especially because it's the hill behind my mum's house, and I go up there all the time. Uh, from the front door, I just turn left onto a farm road, and I'm already climbing. I go through a wooden gate at the top of the lane, up through a steep field, where you can see lambs playing in the spring, where in winter, if it snows, the sledging is second to none. At the end of the field, there's a stile leading into a small wood, carpeted with bright bluebells in April and May, in summer, where the air is thick and potent with wild garlic, and in late autumn, everything is dark and dripping. There's a short trudge through the wood, and you get to three old stone steps up the side of a wall, then a steep diagonal path up a bank, onto a muddy track, which uh, is incidentally marked as a road on some maps and I think GPS systems, because every so often it destroys a luckless lost saloon car. Uh, anyway, you leave this path quickly, cut up towards the right, through another field, through thick bramble bushes uh, that deliver sweet and tangy blackberries in early autumn and scratches for the unwary the rest of the time. There's another gate, short climb, and then it's just scarred and the long stretch of the escarpment. The path cuts through a small declivity, so you don't get the full view yet, but no matter. The hilltop itself is lovely enough. It's a big expanse of brown grass and heather and rocks punctuated by just a few wind-battered trees and hawthorn and juniper bushes. It's bleak and stony, but that has its own rugged charm. Not to mention, it's only in interest. There's a limestone pavement to the left of the path. It's a geographer's dream of cliffs and grikes and a special ancient place. On we go, don't get too distracted because the track is generally pretty muddy and there are loose rocks to watch for. Also, Quite often, gigantic hairy red cows with long horns. They didn't do much more than stand around, chewing the cud and looking scenic, but you don't want to bump into them. <laughs> the path is flat now, right at the top of the outcrop. There's a gentle, but nevertheless elated, couple of kilometres, and you get to another high dry stone wall. This was built over 100 years ago by unknown hands, one carefully selected rock at a time. It stretches out over the top as far as the eye can see. After that, there's a small pine copse, and the path leads you past some miniature limestone escarpments that look for all the world like scale models of the hill you're on. Then, you take a sharp right, and you're heading for Lord Sea and the summit, which is where the magic really begins. And because my mum's house is so well located, and because I'm a dad, and early mornings don't hold any fear for me, I quite often made up there just after sunrise. I ran up there uh, last winter on a day so foggy that it felt as if it was actually getting darker as the dawn progressed. Until, that was, I got to the last slope towards the cairn of Lord's seat. That took me up above the mist. I found myself looking out over the, over the splendours suddenly visible under the rising sun. Morecambe Bay, the Kent Estuary, the Irish Sea to the south, another temporary sea of rolling fog in the valley below, and to the west and beyond that, the outlines of the Lake District Mountains, brightening into sharp focus, Cartmel Fell, the old Man of Coniston, the Langdale Pikes. The names are evocative enough in themselves, but it's the feeling you get, the strange elation of mountains, of their long campaign against time, of their hugeness in the face of humanity, of their stillness and silence. These are places we can't touch and we can't spoil. And I can't properly verbalise that feeling, 
But it's the same excitement to move the romantic poets to write about sublime nature. And I'm guessing which motivated all those people to send in pictures for Nargis. Uh, in the early morning, there's an extra selfish pleasure too, because if you get there early enough, the Lord's seat is yours. You can be the king or the queen of the mountain. Later on, there'll be panting joggers, there'll be walkers enjoying a well-earned cup of tea there. There won't be so many people that it ruins things, uh, and everyone I've met there has been very nice, I should say, but there is something special about feeling alone amongst all that beauty. And uh, here I should interrupt my previous speech because uh, I've been up there more than once since the first time I, I gave this talk. And now, of course, I sometimes think of Nargis and how much has changed for me in the intervening time since I've given the talk and how little must have changed for her. And I wish I could bring you back something profound from those times thinking about her. Uh, but actually, the truth is that I have a revelation to, to bring you. And in honesty, what I think is fucking hell. Holy shit. What the hell? Because, you know, why is she still in prison? Who are the people that would put a sick woman behind bars for no good reason? You tear her from her children. And I think about, you know, what are they thinking? Are they proud? Do they think they're doing a good job? Do they think it's necessary? Do they just not care? And the frustration is it's impossible to know. It's impossible for her to know. Um, anyway, there I am. I'm on the hill, calming down now. Enjoying myself again. And this solitude I was speaking about, I like it especially because I know it's soon going to end. In fact, most of the time when I'm there, I'm not even really alone, because my dog's with me, his tail wagging, making the most of things, sharing and adding to the joy of being there. I also know that when I get back, I'll get to see my family. My mum's house is a glass front door leading to the kitchen, and as I approach, I generally see my daughter sitting at the table having breakfast, and that's better than all the other views in the world. And so I, I just wish that simple delight for Narcos I wish the day will come soon when she can enjoy companionable, companionable loneliness and freedom of mountains. As it is, we know what she has to endure. Harder still, we know she's a mother of young children and has been denied the most basic and deepest joy of knowing that the next hello is just a short walk away. Um, before I finish, I want to read a quick extract from a poem she wrote in September 2017 called Three Goodbyes. When Ali and Kiana were eight and a half, I got them ready for school in the morning, and they left. The security guards attacked my home again. This time, Ali and Kiana were not home. I picked up their photo from the bookshelf and kissed them goodbye, and was led to the car to men who had no mercy. And now, in September 2017, I have not seen them in two and a half years. My writing might not be correctly worded, but it has the certainty of feeling the pain of mothers throughout history, the mothers who take pride in their convictions from one side and feel the pain of conviction being away from their children, taken away. It's gone time she was allowed to see those children. Uh, but this time I want to end on a more hopeful note than I have on the two previous occasions, um, which is a note that Narcos herself wrote in that letter I mentioned from December. And she says, the dictators have not learned from history. Throughout this country's history, the suppression of every protest has set the stage for more powerful ones in the future. It is clear that the shape and size of subsequent protests will be determined by how the regime reacts to the current one. Thank you.